Hello everyone and welcome to this very special virtual event in partnership with Macmillan Publishing. I'm Mike and today we're celebrating the Adventures on Trains series. Written by authors Sam Sedgman and M.G. Leonard, the Adventures on Trains series includes the Highland Falcon and the Kidnap on the Californian Comet. Now you've seen a little bit about this on our social media and we did have an event planned where you'd be able to meet the authors and learn a little bit more about the books, but unfortunately due to the current climate that wasn't possible. But we didn't want to stop you from getting to know these books, so here we are today. Let's have a look at what's coming up in the next hour. We fired some questions at Sam Sedgman and M.G. Leonard, the authors of the Adventures on Train series. We'll be drawing along with illustrator Eliza Paganelli. We visit the Margate Bookshop to talk trains in books. Sam and Maya will also be giving us a reading from the California Comet. And we have a very special competition. Thank you for joining us and it's all aboard Adventures on Trains. Well, I've loved trains ever since I was a little boy. I grew up with a railway line at the bottom of my garden and whenever I would hear a train coming down the tracks, I would run down to the end of the garden, jump up onto the compost heap and wave at it as it went past. And you must always wave at a train as it goes past because the driver sometimes will blow the horn or the whistle for you, which is very exciting. So I've always loved trains. I um, loved playing with uh, my dad's Hornby train set when I was growing up. Um, and it's something that's always been a part of my life. Whereas I didn't love trains when I was a little girl. Uh, in fact, I didn't grow to love trains at all until I was a grown up. Uh, and my son, my oldest son, who is now 15, was train crazy when he was little. Uh, and my husband had his Hornby collection from his own childhood. Uh, and when my oldest son got to a certain age, my husband took these trains out of the loft uh, and it was the fact that they were so like the real train that really captured my son's imagination and he loved trains and very quickly i now have two sons my house became full of railway tracks all sorts of different locomotives it still is and uh and really that was the beginning we would go on holidays where we'd do steam train rides uh and yeah hornby's always been a part of our life ever since Well, my son's loving trains so much uh, was the beginning of the Adventure on Train series. My oldest son got to about the age of seven when he started looking for chapter books, books that he could read on his own, in his head. And of course, because he loved trains so much, he wanted to read books that were about real trains. However, all I could find in libraries and bookshops were magical trains powered by glitter or just crazy trains that weren't real and it was the detail and the facts about locomotives that really inspired him and he had an amazing vocabulary and he knew all the terms for all of the different things like points on a railroad and stuff uh, and he understood how signals worked and he wanted an adventure set on a real train and it was at this point that I had the beginnings of an idea where I was like oh, if only these books existed However, I didn't know anything about trains and I didn't feel I had any confidence in my ability to write these kind of adventures. But at the time I worked with Sam. Yes, we used to work together at the National Theatre in London and behind my desk I decorated the wall with lots of uh, old maps of uh, abandoned railways and old railway maps and things like that. I actually did my I did my master's dissertation about the abandoned tube station at Oldwich in London. So Maya knew I was train mad and um, she uh, had already written her Beetle Boy books and I asked her, what are you going to write next? And she told me that she was thinking of writing a book about trains and I got very excited because I love trains and always have and I got very excited and I said oh my god that's so incredible I would have loved to have read those books and I was a boy you should write one about this train or this train you could set it in this country and they could be mystery stories because I also loved detective stories when I was growing up I read every Agatha Christie novel I could get my hands on um, so I got very excited May got very excited too and after we'd been talking for a few hours we sort of had um, the germ of this idea really this idea for a series of books 
uh, all adventures set on trains all over the world. We have been very lucky and we have managed to do quite a lot of travel. I was lucky enough to go on the real life California Comet for my birthday a few years ago. The real life train is called the California Zephyr and it goes all the way from Chicago to San Francisco in America. And that was sort of my research trip, the basis for that second book in our series, which was very exciting. I think we would both really like to travel an awful lot more and we'd love to say that we're going to go on all of the train journeys that our books are based on. But sadly, um, we're not millionaires. That's not possible. <laughs> uh, we, we would love to but it's just uh, not feasible for us to do that all the time. But we have done some. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't able to go on the California Zephyr and I've got serious Zephyr en envy. But um, we did manage to go in January, just before COVID took over the world. Uh, we did manage to go on a research trip uh, from St Pancras in London, all the way to the top of the Brocken Mountain uh, in Germany. Uh, and that was an amazing journey that is going to inform our fourth book, in the series and it was planned meticulously by Sam um, but the most exciting bit of that really uh, for me was getting to spend my first night on a sleeper train I'd never done that before so um, so yeah that research trip was a delight and we hope to be doing many more so in the Highland Falcon Thief you will find a character uh, who's a Baron, a German Baron Essenbach, his name is, and he is famed throughout Europe for having the greatest model railway in his castle in Germany. So he's introduced as a character in book one, and we always were planning to have uh, at least a chapter, if not like several scenes, in a place that is literally from floor to ceiling model railway. It's not in book one, uh, but it will be making an appearance in book four. My dad's Hornby train set has always been really important to me. Um, he had it when he was growing up and passed it on to me and my brother when we were old enough to start playing with it and making our own train sets. And for me, Hornby's always really been at the heart of my family's kind of love of trains. As a family, we would often take holidays to different steam railways around the country and exploring the magic of trains and steam is something that we would always do as a family and it's something that's felt very important to us as a group of people. So one of the things that we really wanted to capture, especially with the Highland Falcon Thief, but really with all of our stories, is the, the idea that trains are something that really bring people together and that there's a real magic to them. And for me, that's always been something that I've associated with Hornby. We absolutely can. As Maya mentioned, the fourth book is going to be set in Germany, but the third book that is coming out next year in February is called Murder on the Safari Star. And as the name suggests, it is a murder mystery set on board a rail safari in South Africa. Uh, Hal and Uncle Nat travel to Pretoria and take the train all the way through South Africa and Zimbabwe right to Victoria Falls. And a passenger is found dead in a locked compartment. So the Safari Star, of course, is a wonderful steam powered adventure uh, through many parts of Southern Africa, but it also has lots of amazing animals uh, and there are plots within plots and twists and puzzles aplenty on this amazing uh, train pulled by a locomotive called Janice. Now Janice is a Class 25 NC. Um, which we did a lot of research trying to work out what kind of locomotive we wanted pulling um, our train in South Africa. We didn't get the opportunity to go to South Africa, so we were very clear that we wanted to get all the details right. One of the frustration, one of the frustrating things about that is that we didn't, didn't get the chance to go and see the real life train in the flesh. So after we decided on our locomotive, we were very happy with it, but we thought, oh, are we going to be able to describe this correctly? And then I discovered um, although most of these locomotives are in Africa, one of them, it turns out, by a complete twist of fate, is at the Buckinghamshire Railway Centre right here in England. So on the hottest day of the year, and it really was the hottest day of the year this summer, Mayor and I both went out to the Buckinghamshire Railway Centre and got to look around this incredible Class 25 locomotive and walk the length and breadth of it. It is huge. It's more than twice my height. We got to climb all over it, go up on the footplate, get really up close and personal and take in every detail that we could and really bring that locomotive to life in our new book. And we asked our guide why the train was called Janice, because we've named the train 
in the Safari Star after Janice in Buckinghamshire. And, uh, and he said that often train drivers would name the locomotive after their wives. So it feels really wonderful that actually we've paid homage to Janice, the train driver's wife, by calling our locomotive in book three uh, her name. A4 Pacific has to be. That's why uh, I was really keen to have it be the starring, uh, have the starring role in the Highland Falcon Thief, the fastest steam engine in the world. Can't be beaten. So I didn't know a lot about locomotives when we started writing these books and Sam took me to the York Railway Museum, which was incredible. I thought it was going to be a bit boring, but boy was I wrong. Uh, and when he took me to the Railway Museum to see Mallard, to see the A4, which I grant it's a beautiful train, uh, it was next to this princess class, which was just beautiful with streamlined gold paint uh, along the sides uh, of this kind of maroon chassis. And I, I think that's my favourite locomotive. <laughs> so, don't get jealous now. My favourite Hornby model is this baby. Because when the Highland Falcon Thief, my... Uh, Oh, our first train book was published, my husband got in touch with Hornby and asked what, who your prototype modellers were and he got this made. Now I don't know if you can see that there, but that is a prototype A4 class Royal Claret, because of course most of the A4 classes were lovely blue, uh, model of the Highland Falcon Thief, which of course is a fictional train and this is the only existing Hornby model of that train and I own it so yeah this is my favourite model. I mean she says don't get jealous <laughs> I'm desperately jealous uh, but I do have my own uh, favourite Hornby model um, I'm not sure if it's manufactured anymore but there is a model of the Titfield Thunderbolt which is um, a, a train from a really famous film called the Titfield Thunderbolt which if you haven't seen it is so fantastic it's about a village in England in the 19... 50s or 60s trying to save their rural branch line from the beaching axe. It's wonderful, it's funny, I watched it over and over and over again when I was a kid and the idea of having a model of that train was just be so exciting to me. I think the best adventure that I've been on or we've been on together mm. really was research for book four because I have never done a train holiday. I mean it was not a holiday, it was a research trip but Usually a train is something that I've taken to get from A to B and it's the A and the B that are important, not the bit in between. But when we did that research trip, Sam did the entire schedule. Uh, he took me on seven trains in one day. Uh, and of course, we started off at St Pancras. We went to Paris. We got the TGV out of Paris. Uh, we went to the border of Paris and Germany. We got the 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 night jet was it called the, the night jet the australian yeah. sleeper service the night jet from... australian austrian my goodness <laughs> <laughs> we got the night jet uh, from the border and i woke up uh, on the approach to berlin it was amazing uh, and it was so incredible to realize that you could go through so many countries in such a short period of try time on such a wonderful mode of transport and see so much of the country i think that was really my greatest adventure and it's the last adventure i had before lockdown so i remember it very fondly it was really special to me too um the actual um taking the actual steam train up from this town in germany called Wernigrode at the foot of the Harz mountains right the way to the top of the brocken mountain is just a spectacular journey to go on um, it's a narrow gauge railway. It's the last remaining, I believe, uh, fully timetabled and operational steam railway service in Europe. And you get on this glorious locomotive in these small narrow gauge carriages and you wind up through the mountains, up above the tree line to where there's snow and ice. And you have all of this wonderful German landscape dropping out beneath you. And I remember Mayer and I standing on the veranda of one of these carriages with the smell of coal dust in the air, watching the world fall away beneath us. And it was just completely magical and it's that feeling of wonder and amazement that we really want to capture in our books. So this is a tough mm. question because quite often the one that's the newest um, is the favourite but uh, for me at the moment California Comet um, I guess it's maybe because I didn't get to go to America and do the journey uh, it really lives large in my imagination. 
uh, and it's a journey that I'm very excited about doing and it's got a twist that I don't think that people will expect and it also really evokes a culture that I passionately love you know it's real got that flavor of America um, and so it feels pretty like fantastic very kind of movie-esque and cinematic so yeah at the moment it's California Comet for me. California Comet's really special to me too but I think the new one for me is the exciting one uh, Murder on the Safari Star which is coming out in February I think is the one that I'm most excited about because it's a murder mystery on a train it's everything that I've ever wanted to write <laughs> um, it's a locked room mystery it's a uh, of a closed system of suspects. It's set in an incredible country with amazing scenery. The train is glorious. It has everything that I want in a book and I think it's gonna be something really special and we can't wait for you to read it. Well, this is an easy question for me because I know that as soon as I have the money, I would like to buy a ticket on the Orient Express from London to Venice to take my husband there because that's where we had our honeymoon. So I would really love to travel on the Orient Express and get off in Venice. I think that would be amazing. I, I mean, I wouldn't say no to the Orient Express. It <laughs> sounds like a very classic choice, um, but I am already planning my uh, railway journeys to have as soon as uh, the COVID pandemic has, has has lapsed a little bit and, and international train travel is possible. I'm really excited to do a railway journey from London to Lisbon. I'll take the Eurostar to Paris, spend some time in Paris, get the TGV down to Lyon. I've never been, the food is supposed to be incredible. Then get the high-speed train over the Pyrenees to Barcelona, spend some time at the beach, then get the Ave high-speed train to Madrid. I've never been to Madrid, it's supposed to be spectacular. And then finally take the overnight Lusitania sleeper service all the way to Lisbon and have some beers on a rooftop overlooking the sea. That just sounds like the perfect trip. Amazing. We just have to say that we are so delighted to be working with Hornby. It seems like such a natural partnership and pairing. Uh, when you guys got in touch with us, uh, we were just delighted. And in my house, my Hornby merch is prime real estate. My seven-year-old has already stolen my mug and filled it with orange juice and told me that that means that it's his. So uh, yeah, uh, absolutely delighted that the books uh, and the models are working together. I think particularly because, you know, when you create a world in which you set a story, it's not that different from when you create a world uh, in which you set your model train. Like it's all world building, it's all imaginative and it's all creative. And it feels to me like there's that such that symbiosis of creativity between the two uh, projects. I really feel like I'm getting in touch with my childhood again, working and writing these books. And Hornby was such a big part of my childhood. It feels like the perfect match. So I too am really pleased that we're working together. Um, and it was so lovely to speak to you today. Yeah, thank you, so thank you for having us. Thanks for talking to us. Bye! Bye! <laughs> Hi everyone, I am Elisa Paganelli and I am the illustrator of Adventures on Trains. I am an Italian illustrator and I am now living and working in the UK. Um, well, I have two wonderful desk mates who are my two cats. I love nature, animals, wildlife and adventures. And I love working on this series because it's so easy to feel the urge to pack your baggage and jump on a train. And I love the mystery feeling. I love the fact that an adult and a child investigates mysteries together. And in each book you find something new, something different and you, even if you can try to guess who the thief is, for example in the first book, you are never sure until the very end. Uh, so I think that's why, that's just one reason why this is such a success and I love this series so much. Um, so. Uh, what I'm going to do today is to sketch something. Oh, here we go. She is Topi, one of my deskmates. 
and I'm going to sketch something and I want to invite you to draw something as well as, um, and perhaps share it with me. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Don't be shy, just draw what you like. I already seen beautiful drawings from fan of the series so I'm really curious to see more and more of that kind of artworks and I hope you like what I'm going to do. So a white page can be sometimes intimidating but not today because I already know what to sketch for you and it is Harrison Back Hall, the main character of Adventures on Trains. Uh, I usually quickly and lightly sketch the body before starting with the details just to have an overview of the proportions. Then I start sketching the eyes and each features of the face, um, freckles included. Fun fact is that uh, when I draw expressions, I usually unintentionally mime the same expression. <laughs> I don't know why that happens. I'm completely absorbed of, and I'm completely into what I'm drawing at the point that I do the same expression and that's funny but I'm not completely aware of that so it just happens I can help it um, so here we have Hal with his sketchbook and his anorak do you remember the color of his anorak I would like to have one like that Usually I sketch quite quickly in the first uh, outline. Here we go. Here we have the outline. Then we go ahead with the shading process. It's a matter of layers, so I start quite lightly and then I, I, go, I go over uh, the parts that I want to be darker. Here we go. This is my sketch of heart and I put a piece of paper over it just to protect it while I go ahead with the, uh, the second part of my sketch which is a bit more graphic and it is the title of the first book. I used to be uh, a graphic designer before becoming an illustrator. That was many years ago but I, I wanted to add this touch to the sketch. Before filling up each letter, 
I uh, lightly uh, sketch them uh, just to have them in the right place before. touch here for the graphic part and then a bit of color I hope you like this sketch and I really look forward to see your artworks. Hello, I'm Sam Sedgman, one of the authors of The Highland Falcon Thief, and these are my top interesting facts about trains. Trains invented time as we know it. Before the railways, every town set its own time by the sun. But for the trains to be on time, there had to be a time. So time was standardised, so it was the same everywhere. The fastest steam train in the world was an A4 Pacific called Mallard. It was bright blue. It went 126 miles per hour, powered only by coal and water. It's the same kind of locomotive that's in our book, The Highland Falcon Thief. The longest train journey in the world is the Trans-Siberian Express that goes from Moscow to Vladivostok in Russia. It travels more than 6,000 miles and can take more than six days. The fastest train in the world is in Japan and it's called a maglev train. It can go at more than 370 miles per hour and it hovers above the tracks powered by magnets. One of my favourite kinds of train are the ones that the post office used to use to collect and sort mail and parcels from all over the country. They would sort the mail on board to be as fast as possible and scoop it up from the side of the track from a big net and throw it off again with a big catapult. My name is Francesca and I run and own the Margate Bookshop, which has now been open for about a year and a half. It's been, it's been going really well, business has been good. Um, business has been um, better than last year this time actually, since having reopened uh, mid-June, um, so that's really positive. They've been doing quite well, yeah. I think there's quite a lot of excitement about the new one when it came out, to, um, yeah. I think there's something about, for me personally anyway, there's something about being on a train and reading a book. I think it's a really good place to read and write when you're just sat on a good train journey and sort of you can take breaks, look out the window, that kind of thing. So I think there must be a connection in that kind of atmosphere that then has inspired people to write and set books on trains. Maybe, I'm not sure. <laughs> Great place for mystery, I guess because you're sort of confined, I guess we're all used to that now, being confined in a space. But you can have, yeah, space, landscape outside, which is changing, but the inside's always the same. And then you've got your characters who are kind of, again, still be set because there's no one coming in. Well, not usually, you don't have anyone coming in from outside. So maybe there's something in the way that it's set up, almost like, um, like a stage, I guess. Yeah, so everyone who buys the, the set of the two books will be entered into a competition and the prize will be drawn at the end of the year when the promotion's up um, to win this lovely 
um, train sets, which I have had a little go on and it's brilliant. I think books have been, they've, they've been really popular again. There's been a really like kind of increased demand as people are kind of spending more time indoors, spending more time at home and kind of reaching out to kind of pastimes that maybe they've kind of abandoned for a bit. I think books are extremely important for children. I think a love of reading, I think in most people it starts when you're young. Um, I think it's a great way to, to learn about things. Hello, I'm MG Leonard. And I'm Sam Sedgman. And we're here today to read to you from Kidnap on the California Comet, the second book in our Adventures on Trains series. The chapter we're going to read for you today is uh, from near the beginning of the book, when Hal and Uncle Matt are just about to board the train at Chicago's Union Station. Chapter Two, The Silver Scout. Descending a sloping walkway, they came to a row of underground platforms, each beside a train as tall as Hal's house. They're huge, Hal exclaimed. Double deckers, said Uncle Nat, walking towards track F. Quite standard in Europe. It's us Brits who have small trains. Why? Our bridges and tunnels are low. You'd never fit one of these superliners through Box Tunnel. Uncle Nat came to a halt and let out a low whistle. Well, would you look at that? He was staring at an old silver bullet-shaped train carriage, polished so it looked brand new. An Art Deco sign above a row of tinted windows read California Comet, and a smaller sign beneath them read Silver Scout. Hal gaped at it. It was beautiful. That is one of the original six Vista Dome observation cars built for the California Comet in 1948. Uncle Nat spoke in a hushed voice as they approached it. I'd heard August Razor had refurbished one as his private rail car. He looked at Hal. This must be it. Private rail car? Hal had never heard of such a thing. Your own carriage to attach to any train. Uncle Nat shook his head. I wonder what it's like inside. He reverently brushed his fingertips over the Silver Scout sign. Hal slid off his rucksack, kneeling on it as he tugged his sketchbook from his pocket. I'm going to draw it. He pulled out his tin of pencils and sharpened one to a fine point. Leaning the book on his knees, he drew a squared off bullet shape and the corrugated grooves that marked the body of the carriage. He outlined the edge of the neon light in the bottom panel of the rear door that blazed California Comet in red. I'm going to have a peek around the other side, said Uncle Nat, disappearing. Hal sketched the domed roof the curved window panels in silver frames that rose up from the centre of the carriage reminded him of an aircraft gunner turret. What do you think you're doing, kid? Hal froze. It was the muscly man from the Great Hall. I'm drawing the Silver Scout, sir. He held up his sketchbook. The man folded his arms, his biceps bulging. That's a private carriage. Leave him alone, Woody. The blonde girl in the pink cardigan Hal had seen earlier stepped out from behind him. She looked older than Hal, but not by much. She glanced at his drawing and smiled. Hey, that's good. There was a touch of French to her soft American accent. I draw too, comics mainly. I copy uh, Asterix and Tintin to practice, but I also make up my own. It's just an outline, Hal said, getting to his feet. I'll work on it later, on the train. Isn't it the coolest carriage you've ever seen? It's my father's, the girl shrugged, apparently unimpressed. Oh, this must be August Razor's daughter, Hal thought, remembering Uncle Nat's job to cover the press conference. He held out his hand politely. My name's Harrison. Woody stuck out an arm to prevent the handshake, but the girl sidestepped, grabbing Hal's hand with both of hers. Miss Razor! Oh, come down, Woody, she tutted. He's hardly going to attack me with you standing there like a great ogre. Or are you worried he'd beat you in a fight? Hal dared not smile in case he angered the man, who he realised must be her bodyguard. I'm Marianne. Are you coming on the California Comet? Yes, I'm going to San Francisco with my uncle. How far are you travelling? <sighs> she blew out a sulky breath that kicked up her fringe. Who knows? I do what my father decides. I'm told nothing. 
But we live in Silicon Valley, which is not far from there. Oh, I see, said Hal. Marianne clearly wasn't happy about going on this train journey. He remembered how he'd first felt about being shipped off on the Highland Falcon. Maybe it won't be so bad. Woody cleared his throat loudly. Bowie, Marianne snapped, rolling her eyes at Woody. I must go. Maybe I will see you on the train. She leaned forward, kissing the air in front of his cheeks. On the second kiss, she whispered, I'll escape the ogre and come find you. Perhaps we can draw. She stepped back, waved her fingertips, and allowed Woody to shepherd her into the Silver Scout. Dumbfounded, Hal stared at the carriage door. It was the most baffling encounter he'd ever had with a girl. He wished his friend Lenny were with him. She'd be able to explain what had just happened. Have you finished your drawing? Uncle Matt was striding towards him. We should find our carriage. Hal nodded and followed his uncle along the platform. The double-decker carriages were the same silver as the Razor's rail car, but dented and scuffed. Between the windows of the top and bottom floors was a blue band topped by a thin red and white stripe. This is us, Uncle Matt pointed. Carriage 540. Stepping inside, they were met by a woman in a dark blue uniform with curly brown hair. Y'all travelling with us today? Indeed we are, Uncle Matt replied. Well, good. Your tickets, please, sir. The woman beamed as she examined them. You're in the right place. I'm Francine, your steward. You gentlemen are in room at 10. I'll show you up. She led them past a luggage rack and up a slender flight of stairs. We're on the top floor, Hal exclaimed. Sure are, Francine smiled at him over her shoulder. On either side of the upper corridor were sliding doors through which Hal could see tiny compartments, each containing two big blue seats facing each other. You'll be right here, Francine stood aside to let them in. Get yourselves comfortable and I'll be back to see about your dinner reservations. Anything you need, you call out my name. Home sweet home, Uncle Matt sighed happily. He slid the door shut and dropped his leather holder onto one of the big blue seats. Hal clambered onto the other one, pulling at handles and flicking switches, eager to discover the secrets of the roomette. It was snug, but the seats were wide and they had enough room. This is cool. A table marked with a chessboard folded out from beneath the window. Do you think Francine has pieces? Probably. Uncle Matt pointed to the plug socket. Look, you'll be able to charge your games console. I didn't bring it. Really? Uncle Matt looked surprised. Well, I didn't want to miss anything. Hal felt his face grow hot. If I'm gaming, I might not notice an adventure, you know, if one happens. I am glad, said Uncle Matt, though it's unlikely we'll encounter another adventure quite like the last one. Well, it doesn't hurt to be alert, though, does it? Hal thought about Marianne Razor and her muscle-bound bodyguard, wondering if she would escape and come looking for him. No, Uncle Matt said, taking off his glasses, cleaning them with the bottom of his jumper and putting them back on. And an adventure doesn't always have to involve a crime. The exciting ones do. Uncle Nat laughed. You'll end up being a railway detective when you grow up. Hal thought that wouldn't be a bad job. He pointed to a panel above the window. If the top bunk is up there, where's the other one? You're sitting on it. Uncle Nat fiddled with a catch near the floor and, with a jolt, Hal's chair slid forward, becoming flat as it met the opposite seat. Oh, nice! Uncle Matt sat down beside Hal. Through that window, you'll get to see the wonders of America. It's an incredible place. I thought it would be like England, but it isn't, is it? Everything is extra here. The roads are wider, the cars are bigger, even the food portions are huge. Hal paused momentarily overcome by the scale of America. It makes me feel small. You'll get used to it. And then, when you go home, you'll think everything in crew is tiny. Uncle Nat looked at him over his glasses. Travelling changes you. Marvelling at new places is an important part of that. It makes you think about different ways of living. He pulled his journal and pencil case from his bag and placed it in a nook beside the chair. This can be my seat. Pulling back his sleeve, he looked at one of the three watches on his left wrist. At first, 
Hal had thought it odd that his uncle wore six watches. They told the time in London, New York, Tokyo, Berlin, Sydney, and Moscow. But each was a souvenir from his travels, and Uncle Nat had explained that he liked to be aware of the rest of the world, wherever he was. We've just enough time to stroll up the platform and see the locomotive, if you'd like. Let's do it! Hal jumped to his feet, running down the stairs and jogging along the platform, they passed the single-storey baggage car where cases were being loaded from a forklift truck. As they approached the front of the train, the rumble of engines grew to a roar that made Hal's ribs vibrate. The air stank of diesel. Two blue and silver locomotives growled in the shadows of the underground station, their vents thrumming with exhaust. Each was the size of an articulated lorry and had a face a pair of shadow-filled windscreens above two blazing pairs of circular headlights. They're not as friendly looking as steam engines! Hal had to shout so Uncle Nat could hear him above the noise. Diesel electric! Uncle Nat called back, nodding. Genesis class! There's a power plant in her belly with twice as much horsepower as an A4 Pacific! He gazed at the engines. Magnificent! Why are there two? They have to drag this very heavy train up the Rocky Mountains. Uncle Nat waved at the carriages. If there were only one engine and it failed, we'd be in trouble. Hal stared at the leading locomotive. It glowered back at him. He slipped his hand into his pocket and realised his sketchbook was back in the roomette. So he studied the engine's shapes, hoping to draw it from memory. Uncle Nat touched Hal's arm and pointed. The luggage car doors were being shut and empty baggage trailers driven away. Time to go. Walking back, Hal saw Francine leaning out of the door, flapping her hands at them to hurry. They broke into a run and she laughed as they scrambled aboard. I wouldn't have let them leave without you, she said as the carriage door shut behind them. Tumbling into their roomette, Hal and Nat dropped into their seats just as the concrete pillars of Union Station slid past the window. What's this? Uncle Nat leaned down, picking up an envelope from the floor. He pulled out a card and drew in a delighted breath. How? It's a message from August Razor. We've been invited to visit him in the Silver Scout. Now, it wouldn't be a special event if we didn't have a competition for you. We wanted to give you a chance to read the Adventures Unchained book series. So we're giving away a copy of each of the books for you to enjoy. But that's not all. We're also giving away a Family Fun Project starter pack so you can start your very own model railway layout. To enter is easy. All you have to do is be subscribed to our channel by midnight on Sunday, the 8th of November 2020. And we will be randomly selecting a winner. Simple. Good luck to everyone. So that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. Thank you to Sam and Maya, to Eliza and to Francesca at the bookshop in Margate. Thank you to Macmillan Publishing and thank you to you for watching. If you'd like to know any more about the Adventures on Train series, we have lots of information on hornby.com. So there's nothing more to say but choo-choo, we'll see you next time.